Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Reputation Igniter podcast. So great to have you with us. Uh, If you haven't already, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell to make sure that every time a new episode drops that you are in the know. And if you feel so inclined, writing a review always helps get this podcast out to more and more HVAC owners like yourself. Uh, Today on board, we have Russ Kimmel. Russ, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for inviting me. My pleasure. And he is the owner of Evergreen Heat and AC, and we'll be diving in a little bit in the discussion about non-union versus union uh, HVAC uh, companies. So really excited to kind of dive in as this is an area we haven't really touched. And as you know, or maybe you're a first time uh, listener, our focus here is to bring leading experts um, in the industry just to give you insight and information on how you can grow and scale your business the best way possible. But I think the real gem, and that's why I love having people like Russ on the show, is having HVAC owners just like yourself who have been successful in the industry who know and have a certain uh, area of expertise come onto the podcast and share their insight, their in- uh, input. And all of my guests are by referral only. So Russ is here because of an introduction made by another HVAC business owner, uh, as you as a listener uh, could tell. And we are just super excited to kind of dive into his insight and his perspective um, that is very unique. I, uh, I This is something, obviously, having lived in the Pacific Northwest, being very familiar with it, but um, understanding and learning about the business mechanics of having a non-union versus a union business. I'm really excited. So let's jump in here, Russ. First, if you wouldn't mind just sharing kind of a quick Reader's Digest version, kind of maybe five minutes of just kind of a here to there. How'd you get started in the HVAC industry? And where are you with uh, Evergreen State Heat and AC at the moment? Yeah. Uh, So I got my master's in business at the University of Washington, uh, Seattle area, which is now known as the Foster School. And after that, I was independent consulting, more of a strategy operations type guy, uh, for about five years, um, at some point in time, I decided I'd rather own a business and consult businesses. I uh, found this business through a broker, absolutely completely ignorant of HVAC, other than the fact that my undergrad was in mechanical engineering at uh, Massachusetts Amherst, and I took a class called HVAC, but that was a development of like propellers, uh, impellers, and things like that, and and, and blower motors and, and heat transfer and things like that, which had absolutely no uh, ability to help me do my job. So right. I came in there. My first day in the job as an owner, um, I was a complete ignoramus, completely dependent upon uh, my employees uh, on existing customer base. Uh, and as a union contractor, sheet metal contractors of Western Washington, uh, which I'm going to be incoming president this December. Oh, but wow. uh, that was an organization which I got a lot of mentorship which I desperately needed. Bought the company in in October of 1998, so it's been just over 25 years that uh, my wife and I have owned the company. Again, as you mentioned, we were a union HVAC company. Uh, We were initially based out of Everett. We're now based out of the Maltby area, which is an area in in South Snohomish County towards Woodenville. Um, We are residential and light commercial, about 50-50 both. Uh, in some days like this, we're going to be more residential because of the high interest rates kind of inhibiting light commercial uh, opportunities. Uh, in some years, we're much bigger light commercial because uh, that's the growing area. But uh, we're one of very few residential union HVAC contractors in the, the greater Seattle area. There are a few south and a few north of us, um, south being Lacey, north being Bellingham. But uh, in, in the greater Seattle area, we're signatory to both Local 66 of SMART, which is a sheet metal workers, and signatory to Local 26 of, uh, of United um, gosh, UA, uh, the, the okay. Plumbers Union. Gotcha. Awesome. Love it. Um, and that's cool. I mean, I think it's, it's always interesting going into anything and relying on your people, right? And I think that really can can indicate the strength of the business prior prior to you, yeah. right? Depending on whether they help you or they hurt you, right? Um, and so it sounds like you definitely uh, made some great strides there and you leaned on an organization, like you said, to gain that mentorship. So uh, it sounds like that's definitely a good solid path for anybody that maybe comes in and, and doesn't feel like they've got their feet uh, sturdy underneath them is to, to lean on that. What? Just real quick on that, mm-hmm. was there anything in particular um, you did to elicit that mentorship or was, is that something you, you knew that you needed and so you pursued it or was it something that just inadvertently through a couple of recommendations or a chance conversation 
so the organization and the previous owner uh, was also affiliated with this organization because they negotiate the contracts. They've got a lot yeah. of labor management meetings. They also have a lot of yeah. management training programs for owners like myself and my employees. And so from there, I went to national convention. I joined a peer group of other uh, around the United States um, residential peer residential HVAC contractors. We had uh, shy of a dozen, but we had a good number where I could learn from. And these are sometimes second, third generation folks, which mentioned me there. Ooh, cool. um, the few HVAC residential contractors here, I've, some of the owners have also been a mentor to me. Um, I've gotten a lot of mentorship from my wholesalers, primarily Gensco. Uh, oh. they, they're my wholesaler for Train and Mitsubishi, which we are a train a comfort specialist in the Mitsubishi Diamond Dealer. A lot of training there um, through them, both technical for my people in the field and business for myself and, and the people in the office. So I would say uh, a lot of my education has gotten through Gensco, through Train to Mitsubishi and, and other types of organizations, and through what they call SMAC, the Sheet Metal Air Conditioning Contracts in North America, the Western Washington chapter as well as the national chapter. And in right. addition to becoming the incoming president of Western Washington, I'm on the National Residential Steering Committee. Uh, we're meeting in Houston in a few weeks, too. That's a committee of about a half dozen national union uh, residential contractors, and we meet two times a year. Love it. Love it. So let's just let's just go in here. I'm going to pretend I'm super ignorant. Maybe there's, you know, listeners who are ignorant. Maybe there's some that, you know, have, have come up against the idea of maybe, hey, maybe I do want to turn, you know, union or not, right? What would you say is like maybe some of the big, biggest differences between a union versus non-union? And let's just talk, let's focus maybe on the, the residential side, um, yes. you know, shop, and then talking about maybe some of like, not just the differences, but then kind of the pros and the cons, just so as somebody's kind of, you know, weighing those two options that they feel like they make an intelligent decision if they listen to the podcast and then they go on to, to make a switch or a change. The biggest difference, obviously, is the union benefit package that can be, you mm -hmm. know, twenty to twenty-five dollars, even more in some cases, for people that can go between residential and commercial or over and above the base wage. And and the biggest advantage is when you get people in the trade that have uh, a spouse or children or concerned about retirement. Uh, that's in some ways a little bit of a golden handcuff, right? Being one of the very few union residential contractors, uh, we have the ability to get and retain people who are high quality, and they got a family to feed, right? Yeah. And a family to make – and health care is getting more and more expensive all the time. Most non-union companies – I'm not speaking for all, but a great many – um, you know, some are 1099, which are the real cheese ball companies. We all know those. Yeah. <laughs> but most of them that have employees, they they'll they'll get uh, medical for the employees and maybe a 401 program. Uh, the retirement medical is not nearly as comprehensive as mine, so I can get really really good people. And I would say that's the mm -hmm. biggest positive. Um, they have union representation. There's an inherent fairness in it. Uh, is another positive is it's a lot easier to negotiate because the, the wage rates are the wage rates. In some cases, I pay them yeah. over scale because they do sometimes residential and commercial, but it makes uh, a lot of the negotiations a lot simpler and, and transparent. Um, obviously, the challenges, and I would say that the key to the challenges is that it, it requires a different management style. In a non-union mm -hmm. company, from what I understand, I've never owned a non-union company, although my electricians are non-union uh, because they're mainly O2 residential electricians in IBEW. Uh, does not really fit the bill there. They're looking for commercial-based electricians, which doesn't make sense when you're you're hooking up a lot of heat pump outdoor units. And so th that is yeah. a non-union area. But okay. from from the union perspective, because of the pay compensation difference, uh, you know, a lot of union companies or non-union companies, they will incentivize their personnel, both service and installation, based on uh, a low base with uh, ads for productivity and and sales. And they can get away with doing that, and uh, that in some cases for certain organizations, it creates a conflict of interest with the customer because the customer will be talked into buying more than they really need to buy, in some cases buy things that they don't even want because mm -hmm. of the incentive system for them. For me, because uh, I've got a high base wage, and the reality is, is if my guys are working overtime, I'm paying their benefits for every hour. It's not a fixed cost. So if they work right. 50 hours, I pay 50 
hours worth of benefits. It doesn't stand up at 40, and the benefits are more expensive to begin with. So the reality is that uh, my rates, my call-out rates, everything's going to be more expensive, but uh, the reality is, is there's less of a bait and switch to the customers because I can't afford it, and uh, and the customers are basically having us come in with the understanding that this is what the price is going to be and something's going to be clear uh, in terms of if it needs to be an upsell. So so I've, I'm a lot more careful when it comes to overselling customers compared to non-union companies. And it's just not only non-union HVAC industry, especially the plumbing industry is very we're very famous for this, especially in the Puget Sound area of, of upselling customers on things they don't really need. Interesting. Interesting. So what, what you're kind of saying is that if you go the union route, um, one of the benefits is, is that, you know, you don't have to play these guessing games of like, you know, what's the right price to put your hourly wage at, right? Yeah. Which I'm sure, you know, only leads to hiring headaches. But instead, you know, like I said, the rate is the rate. People come in, they've got a certain expectation. They've got a benefits package that's already predefined by the union, right? So they don't have to play those games either, right? So in a way, it takes, it takes a lot of that guesswork out. And then on the on the back end, like in the field, what you're saying is that although your rates maybe initially can be more expensive and there might be some shock if somebody isn't educated properly on the fact of like, hey, we are a union outfit versus a non-union outfit that, um, you know, work may theoretically cost more, but you guys aren't incentivized to oversell in any situation. So re and yeah. it, so it depends on what the consumer wants. If they want more of a um, an open dialogue that has their best interests at heart, it might make sense to maybe pay a little bit more per hour, but knowing that you're never going to make a recommendation for a system or something that would be outside of the scope of what they actually need. So there's more trust inherently in those relationships yeah, it, when you it, say it's a fair assessment. And not sure you're right. Um, the other thing too, that's kind of implied in all that sort of stuff, we've been able to keep our employees. There's not a lot of turnover in our organization. Mm. There's more turnover in the office than there is in the field, which is great. And that's very expensive otherwise. And my employees being union, they're proud to tell that to their customers, um, that they understand the owner has their back and, and has the customer's back. And, uh, you know, they're higher costs because of this, but their goal is to sell what the customer needs, not to oversell. So uh, we're, we're pretty clear on that. Yeah. Um, and again, because you're getting people from the union out office, right? It's they're not shopping around constantly, right? They're not they're not looking for another dollar an hour somewhere else, which is something that I see with my clients yes. just across the country, right? Is somebody will leave for a dollar an hour and and you're just kind of like, you know, why? And, and just like you said, all the investments that you have in your people, you, you lose that as they, they went and started to work for a competitor. And so I think it can be right. very, very frustrating, especially in a <clears throat> what, what, you know, theoretically should, shouldn't be a tight labor market, but it is a tight labor market, right? Is that, you know, right. the, the headache of turnover is one of the things that will eat most of these businesses alone. And it's what keeps most of these guys pretty small. Yep. Yep. That's, that's frequently the case indeed. Yeah. So, um, Maybe we can kind of talk and, and maybe evolve this conversation into like, you know, what what are the what is your sort of sales strategy? I would be interested hearing from, uh, you know, a union outfit like what is your go to market strategy from a marketing and a sales perspective? Obviously, you know, you're your um your unique selling proposition is different than most resi guys right because of your your constraints with you know how much you're paying for your labor what what maybe would you say is different or how maybe are you approaching the sort of the sales and marketing aspect of your business well yeah you know some of the things that we do is is uh, you have to have highly qualified sales people that understand sure. <laughs> uh, the benefits of the union but the reality is, is that you know we sell high quality products, uh, trained Mitsubishi. But but the whole focus is that you can put in the highest quality product with the most incompetent labor, and and it's actually the worst investment you can make. Sure. And the key thing is 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 that uh, we we have extended warranties, uh, and uh, basically uh, great Google reviews, and we what we sell is is peace of mind. It starts with the relationship with the customer, uh, and it and it goes all the way through that sales process, through the installation process. And if you were to go through and take a look at our website, ESSMWA.com, yeah. a number of things that we have in terms of blogs talks about the overall sales process and, and hmm. what is going to be there, the level of professionalism that we have. And the key thing is, is that from when somebody first either sends an email or, or answers the phone call, what is the level of professionalism that the office CSR customer service representative has 
What is the level of professionalism that the salesperson has? Uh, promises made or promises kept. The one real key thing that I basically state is that, you know, we're, we're def- never going to be the, the low cost producer for a variety of reasons. We don't take shortcuts and, and we have uh, living wage paid to our people. But one of the key things is me as the owner, I, I back the sale. Uh, every once in a while, even with trained Mitsubishi, you can install a lemon. It just happens. Uh, once in a while, there's a, a, something coming off the manufacturing plant that's not quite right. Well, it's up to us to make it right and work with our wholesaler to make it right. And Jensko has been supportive of us in this whole process, and we're supportive of our customers. And, you know, if we do your own, we'll damn sure make it right. That's really uh, the, kind of the motto that, that I have and my people have. And to the degree that the service technicians and, and the salespeople and the installers can convey that to the customer really comes down to a peace of mind. Does that answer your question? Yeah. No, I love Good. that. Um, and <clears throat> I, I think there are some, some definite uh, uniqueness to what you guys do versus what a, a non-union does. But there's also a lot of similarities, like you said. You know, the customer yes. experience is very important. But I would say that um, where, you know, obviously – provided that you're actually executing on it, right? Is that level of ownership that you're taking on these products, right? Is something, sometimes something that you will find in the residential space that people aren't doing right now. Yeah. I would probably say, uh, sorry, before you, before you speak, it's just that most of my listeners are probably people who aren't those people, right? But they know that they're running up against that kind of competition, right? You know, the, uh, the whole, uh, my warranty is the, it's the taillight warranty. As soon as you see my t- taillights disappear, the warranty is void, right? Kind of thing. And so it's, <laughs> it's, it's making sure that, you know, you're providing, not only are you putting good stuff in, you've got good quality labor putting it in, but that you also back it up because I mean, if you're in business long enough, right, you will have a unit fail. Like you said, you'll have a lemon, right? And the, the question is, what do you do in that sort of situation? You refer to Google reviews, right? That's the easiest way to really really sort of sour your reputation is just have one person with a long litany of all the stuff that went wrong and how you didn't, you didn't own up to a lot of that. So, um, but I know I was holding you back from a comment. What were you going to say there, Russ? Yeah. The, the, the real key thing is, is, is you mentioned it too. Uh, I know of your audience and what I will say is uh, I'm not trying to denigrate non-union residential HVAC contracts in any way, shape or form, because there's, there's some that um, obviously are scammers and a lot of, uh, the people listening to this podcast will know exactly who they are. They're very transparent. And there's a vast majority of them are small business owners just like me, just happen to be non-union. They have highly ethical people in the office uh, themselves as well as their field people. So I want to make that really clear. Um, it's it's not every non-union company that I'm dealing with. Yeah. Uh, and again, I think to your point, and I didn't really mention this at the beginning of the podcast, but, um, you know, my focus here with the podcast is just to to make the greatest barrier of entry into our industry be the level yes, of professionalism with which you have to execute your business. And so I think you're like you're saying, this is there's there is what what one would think would be a a uh, understood standard of where you probably shouldn't go below. Otherwise, why do you own a business, right? I think that's right. such an important Correct. piece, especially with you know all all the owners that are on listening. It's like. The reason that we do the work that we do is because we want to serve our community. And in so doing, we are able to provide, like you said, a livable wage for our employees. And there's some left over for us to uh, to take care of our family in, in the whole of that where we're just making the world a better place. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate you, you know, coming in Amen. and defending yourself. But don't worry, you, you, you're a good man and uh, we, we know where your intentions are there. And I think it's just something that we're always going to constantly deal with. But like we said, if we can raise the level of professionalism across the industry, there will be less and less people. They'll go to other industries, right? Um, not that we're trying to push them away or we're, you know, giving them bus tickets anywhere, so to speak, but just in the sense that we're just trying to, uh, you know, make sure that what we're doing is is high level. So. Um, what would you say, maybe you can, um, I don't know, and, and maybe this is like too hard to do, but maybe you can give like a, a, a pricing example um, of where somebody might, you know, just, I, I think that might be something that could be helpful to kind of understand the distinction, right? If, if maybe we're putting in a heat pump or something like that, right? Like, you know, understanding like, hey, you know, because the labor wage is more costly for you guys from a, you know, a fixed cost standpoint, like what, what does that look like? I don't know. Maybe that's just you can't do that. It's too hard. It's too dependent. Or maybe you can give an example. I'm just trying to think of something yeah. that might be, you know, I can, I can kind of talk a little bit about pricing too. And I, I think there's really two elements to talk about there. So yeah. um, there, there's multiple elements, but two elements that are key, right? First is, is I'd like to talk a little bit about um, residential maintenance. And then I'll talk okay. a little bit about comparative pricing in general 
when it comes to installations for heat pumps, air conditioners, ductless, and, and gas furnaces without getting high-level specificity. And, of yeah. course, you know, you can't get high-level specificity because every house is different, right? You know, you're – Absolutely. You, every aspect is different, and my salespeople are keen on finding, you know, what, what is something that makes things a little trickier. But let's talk about maintenance first because that's a real key element right there. Great. Um, you see a lot of folks, and, and these are the more unscrupulous ones, saying there's a maintenance for $99, right? And, yeah. and I believe most of your podcast folks have seen that. And the reality is that that's essentially a paid sales call. You're yeah. having a, a maintenance tech, which is basically a glorified salesman, to get out there and for $99 either look for problems to fix whether they exist or not or look to give you a proposal for a brand new system and start that process, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and our goal is to make each maintenance. I would not say when all overhead is factored that our maintenance are profitable because they certainly aren't. Um, yeah. But I would say, you know, by the time you factor in driving and whatnot um, and, and other kinds of things. But I would say maintenance really should be priced in the 250 and more level. Obviously, if someone's going to have a complex heat pump, a geothermal system, which we also work on, you know, they could be even as much as, as $500 or multiple systems. But um, the, the key is is that, you know, you want to make maintenance kind of pay for itself, not necessarily be a loss leader, but you also want to make it ethical for the customer. You want to create a relationship, and obviously we're interested in eventually servicing and replacing the system, but we're not going to do so unless uh, unless it needs to be replaced. Um, if there is uh, a system that's over 20 years old, we're going to give a customer a heads up that, Hey, the system may be on its last legs. Uh, we're going to do some maintenances, but you know, there's going to be warranty issues that are going to be not warranty issues. There's going to be repair issues that may become cost prohibitive. Um, so that will, that's the key thing on the maintenance side. In terms of installation, um, we do work both in the Snohomish County area, which is the area north of Seattle and the east side area, Bellevue, Redmond, kind of the headquarters of, of Microsoft and HQ2 for Amazon. Uh, HQ2 for Google and Facebook and a variety of other high-tech places. Uh, and that particular area, even compared to non-union companies, uh, the, the good non-union companies, and there, there are plenty of them, um, we're, our pricing is pretty comparable to them, right? Nice. Um, I, I would say a lot of those companies are larger. They've got a larger uh, advertising budget and things like that. Their overhead structure in terms of people in the office is such that uh, our prices and their prices are very comparable. Uh, there's always the, you know, somebody working out in the back of their van, it's going to be half our price because essentially their their labor is cheap, their equipment's cheap, and so on and so forth. Um, but, yeah, when it comes to gas furnaces nowadays, um, we're, you know, we're trained company specialists. We sell a lot of S8 V2s, S9 V2s, which are the, the shorter version of the train system's variable speed, and they're going to be seven 8,000, uh, including tax. Uh, when you're selling a basic air conditioning system, you're in a 12 to 13,000 range. A uh, heat pump could be 15 to 16,000 range. It's not unlikely to have systems uh, if someone has uh, more advanced indoor air quality issues, a larger system and a larger house on the east side. It's a five-ton unit. Things get expensive there. We have, we have plenty of jobs, over 20,000, that involve uh, either dual fuel systems, gas furnace heat pumps, or uh, even in some cases um, – with Mitsubishi, we have air handlers and indoor units to, tied into one outdoor unit, one to four. Uh, we don't do a lot of variable refrigerant flow uh, for residential customers, but we do a fair amount of that with commercial customers. Gotcha. So, I mean, with with the comparable, you know, installation price, um, how I'd just be kind of curious, like the like getting down to brass tacks a little bit, not not too much, right? Because every like sure. you said, everyone is is different. Um, the main the maintaining of the comparability right do you you know where do you think that comes from is that from the resi guys going like hey this is where we can get a little bit of extra like squeeze out of it because we can kind of bake it into a bigger process and then we can have them finance it that's the, that, that we'll talk about financing next but um yeah. <clears throat> so is that where you're seeing that because i mean your costs are just your costs right and you're not yes. like aggressively marking up your system do you think that that's why you guys end up being comparable or is there some other sort of efficiency market or we're, internal we're, that... comparable. we're comparable because our overhead is comparatively lower that more than makes up for the delta 
in the costs of the, the residential technician per hour. And they, and they equally balance on the east side. And the right. smaller organizations that are up in uh, Snohomish County, yeah. we are going to be more expensive because gotcha. in some cases our overhead per man hour is higher as well as our cost of labor per man hour. And so okay. we can be 20 to 30 percent more expensive than those guys, including legitimate companies. They're just legitimate small companies, mom and pop working out of their home and Camino Island or Wellington. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So I'm going to ask, uh, so we won't get to the financing just yet. I got one more question because I'm, sure. I'm just, I'm excited that you're here and I think this is just a, a unique dynamic with your, your business, right? So what we're seeing a lot in the industry, right, is I think we, at first people wouldn't sell the, the maintenance agreements because they thought it was junk and they knew it was junk, but then it was one of those things that I think enough people were doing it that most people were like, I got to do it because other people are doing it and all that kind of stuff. Right. But now we're seeing more of like a membership model. Right. And I don't know how familiar right. you are with that, but it is a similar cost. You know, maybe it's $99 or they, you know, they charge them 10 bucks a month or nine bucks a month or something like that, you know, just to kind of get the reoccurring um, credit card uh, charge in there. Right. But the idea there is that <clears throat> they don't do this sort of, false um there's there, there's it's a little bit i feel like more transparent because like you said it's not a paid sales call you do get all these different bennies right um and that would be something like you know first line in the queue when you call uh we'll be out there within 24 hours there's discounts on service there's discounts like is that something you've looked at and if you've looked at it and not implemented it i'd be kind of curious like what what's caused you to kind of maybe push that away or keep that keep that away um does that make sense in my do you know what I'm talking you're, about when I say you're, okay. you're doing a great job? What, I want to make sure that I answer this because there's a lot yeah. of ways to answer this. Uh, typically, that is very much discussed in the process of selling the job. Uh, okay. If it's a five or ten year maintenance, sometimes we build in five or ten maintenances into the end that they can finance through the whole process. Okay. So hmm. that so in order to have an extended maintenance beyond one year, there needs to be built in maintenance. Uh, Yep. Right there, right? Extended warranty. Um, what I'll also say is what's making maintenance much more critical is uh, in, in the greater Puget Sound area, there's basically becoming an outlying, if you will, of gas systems and things are really mm -hmm. pushing away to heat pumps. Heat pump efficiency is, you know, with the HSPF and the COP of 3.0, which used to be only with geothermal, but you're getting 3.0 COP of of uh, high-end inverter heat pumps, you're, you're essentially going through and radically reducing the energy consumption of these systems. Yeah. But these systems all have a lot of moving parts and a lot of yeah. electronics, and there's still a refrigerant-based system that depend on various coils and, and line sets and seals within the coils and line sets that uh, sometimes flow challengingly. Uh, Thermal expansion valves, reversing valves, a variety of things that can go sideways. Sometimes when capacitors and other types of componentry goes out, it can negatively affect the compressor. Sometimes there's going to be things happen in ductwork, which can increase the, the pressure, back pressure in, in the supply side, which can also put pressure in the compressor. And, and these kinds of things need to be maintained at least once per year, mm -hmm. with the caveat that the customer is going to be doing multiple filter changes or electronic air cleaner change outs. Uh, during the year themselves, at least uh, one or two times a year if they have animals up to three or four times a year. Mm -hmm. So so maintenance is becoming more and more critical with the advancement of technology within the residential HVAC system, be it union or non-union. And with the upcoming R454B, um, you've got, got the, the added challenge of the refrigerant being flammable, and you're going to have to components which check on the flammability that make sure there are additional safety features and so on and so forth. And that is going to make things even more complex. And so annual maintenance is going to be more and more important. And, and we just basically tell our customers that essentially what you have here is the equivalent of an oil change, right? right. You're not going to run your car 20,000 miles without an oil change. You know, right. You're know, you going to have a system with lots of bells and whistles and electronics and, and, and blowers and, and um, different types of, of wheels and things like that, they're going to have to be checked once a year, minimum, right? Yeah. Commercially, should be checked four times a year. So does that answer your question? Um, it does. It does. Um, 
in the in the sense that like um under understanding the change the the change in pricing i guess um so for you it really does have to come down to to maintenance right that that the yes. maintenance is necessary for the system and therefore a membership is really just fluff yes. and it's not actually getting yes. to the heart of what needs to be done interesting okay Cool. And, and yeah. our memberships extend the warranty. You know, we call it that, really, because that's okay. really what it is to the customer. It's, uh, again, peace of mind of another year of, you know, you're, you're paying for the maintenance and uh, you're going to have no repairs. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So let's jump into the financing um, piece. Uh, just, I think, <clears throat> because given the economy, obviously, it's it's very interesting with just the interest rates and all that kind of stuff, but also the cost of systems. Like you said, there's more technology involved in all of this stuff. The price of technology it continues to increase. Um, and so the systems themselves are, are much more um, much more expensive. So for you guys, is there anything, first off, is there anything unique about financing a system for a union business versus a non-union business? Um, and if so, how does that impact what you're doing, how you're pricing, anything like that? Yeah, many, many of our customers pay with cash or with credit card okay. or ACH. A lot of them do ACH right now, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that happens also, uh, especially on the east side. They they simply have the added liquidity to do so, or they do some internal lines of credit to be able to, to cover things. Yeah. What I will say, though, in terms of financing, there's Puget Sound Credit Union, which um, is a credit union that we encourage customers to, and we, we can go through and facilitate that process. But as a train comfort specialist, um, there are, uh, I can't remember who the provider is, but there's a finance provider, and we're the maximum level of train comfort specialists, and they discount the finance rates. So for oh. us, um, what we find is, you know, with prime rate at 8%, uh, it's, it's not, it's challenging to go through and offer somebody a five-year same as cash, right? Sure. Because you're going to be paying 15%. Over and above that, and you're going to have to tell the customer, hey, you know what you thought was twenty thousand is is actually going to be twenty three thousand because that's the prepaid interest we have to cover for the next five years, right? Right. Uh, and um, but we have a several percent discount through train, uh, and, and our focus is primarily eighteen months, same as cash. And oh, well, so okay. when it comes down to there, that's right around four percent of cost after the discount from train, and that's a little more than a credit card. Um, we do offer cash discounts for people that do ACHs uh, or, or cash, um, credit cards, and 18-month financing is typical normal pricing. We eat like 1% when it comes to uh, the 18-month the financing, but that's us to do in business. Does that answer your question? It does. It does. I appreciate that. Cool. Thanks, Russ. Well, um, let's, let's kind of – this is going to be my last question, and then we'll kind of wrap it up here. So um, – mm -hmm. Russ, you came on. Um, I've asked you a couple. I've asked you a handful of questions. Um, hopefully, gotten some some great. At least I feel like we've gotten some great wisdom out. What is the question that you wish I had asked you that I haven't asked you yet? Wow. Um, I've been able to stay in business, I guess, for twenty five years. There you go. <laughs> you know what? Um, I. I'm an older guy now, I'm 63, <laughs> uh, bought it when I was uh, 38, literally the day after my 38th birthday, and um, it's been a great ride. I've had unbelievable uh, mentorship. I'm always looking for a better way through uh, national and local smack. has been huge uh, through my vendors, through my employees, um, and tremendous change with relocating. I'm on my third relocation to a nice uh, – little acre plus facility in the Maltby area. Uh, and I depend on my employees really to kind of have my back and it's my job to have their back. And, uh, you know, uh, I tr try and, and live uh, and, and, and walk my talk as much as possible. Uh, I know that I fall on it sometimes. So I do these daily scripture readings and, and things like that. And, and it really is a reminder of how, how I fall short every day, how I should behave. Um, and I'm quick to apologize if if something goes wrong with with a peer, an employee, a customer, or a vendor. Um, and I do. I apologize a lot. And, and and it's just really all about relationships, including with Chris now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. 
Well, thank you, Russ. I think there was a lot of wisdom thank distilled you. into about 45 seconds of that, right, from the mentorship component of it, which I think is just something that, you know, I think we think about, but we're not intentional enough about. Um, you know, obviously, you it sounds like you're a uh, fellow follower of Christ, right? So just, you know, whatever whatever Indeed. that might be for you, you know, just making sure that you're kind of plugging into that to, to gain that sort of that's that sustenance, if you will, from from another mm -hmm. realm. Um, and then, you know, just focusing on making sure that you're just building relationships, right? Nobody's perfect, Amen. right? We're, we're, we're always going to mess things up. But at the same time, the people you surround yourself with, if they do, you know, uh, un understand and honor that, you're only going to strengthen that that relationship as, as you Thanks, go through sir. that stuff. So yeah, appreciate that, Russ. Well, Russ, if our guests um, obviously felt inspired by you, um, that maybe there was a question that I didn't ask, right, that we didn't cover. Um, they had something else uh, additional. What would be a good way? for them to maybe reach out to you to connect with you um if if, if you're a little gun shy to provide you know contact oh, information yeah. or anything like that totally understand but you know so something start like with my my linkedin page perfect right? okay. russell kimball linkedin um evergreen state heat and ac um russ at essmwa.com our corporate name is evergreen state sheet metal uh, essm wa is in the state of washington essmwa.com uh two best ways to get a hold of me uh, and my linkedin page uh Ping me and, and connect, and, and uh, if I see that you're not trying to sell me an improved website, a bank loan, or something along the lines uh, on LinkedIn, uh, I promise you that I will I will connect with you. I'm always willing to connect with other business owners, business service or sales techs or whoever, people that I can learn from and they can learn from me. Yeah, I and appreciate LinkedIn. it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Russ, for all that you've given to the audience already. Um, with that, we're going to wrap up another episode here of the Reputation Igniter podcast. Thank you so much for listening again. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you never miss another episode that we drop. Please write a review if you feel so inclined, or at least go and share this with one other HVAC contractor that you know. Just like Russ said, the importance of mentorship is so key, but I think on top of that is educational resources, and that's what we continue to aim to be. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, our focus here with this podcast is really just elevating that level of professionalism inside of our industry so that the greatest barrier to entry is truly the professionalism of all of us yeah. here in our industry. So thanks again, Russ, and we will see you guys next time. Take, Take care. Bye-bye.